Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark from Right Line Training, and um, we're a little early, so we'll have a, a minute or two to go. So we're just going to hold up for the uh, for the stragglers and uh, traders really are still coming into the room. So we'll, we'll be, we're going to be starting in about two minutes. Okay, we're going to start, and uh, hopefully, if somebody comes in late, they can uh, pick up where we uh, where we are. And what I'm going to be um, uh, reviewing today uh, are our small cap biotech uh, blockbusters. Um, now, these small cap biotech stocks really have the potential to deliver absolutely enormously high. Uh, ROIs or return on investment. The reason almost, I have really not seen anybody else um, um, speak much about them is they are very, very difficult to find, uh, evaluate, and determine which are going to ultimately mature into the best uh, uh, small caps to buy. I'm going to show you the formula that I use to do it, um, and um, uh, and you'll see why very few th that this really is is a discipline that a lot of traders shy away from. But it's tremendously lucrative if you can do it right. Now, just uh, now, real quickly. Um, uh, this mandatory disclaimer that all signals and trading opportunities we provide are for educational purposes only. Everyone understands that trading the markets does involve substantial risk and a person can lose a substantial amount of money. Always carefully consider your financial position prior to trading uh, and never risk more than you can afford to lose. So I say that to everybody um, in my live trading room every morning. So it's, it, is, it is actually important. Now, just a little bit of background real quickly about myself, if you, you haven't heard me uh, give a webinar before, is um, I'm a graduate from Ivy League University. Um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania uh, for eight years, and actually I majored in applied mathematics. Within that field, I focused on mathematical modeling. Now, you're going to see this discipline is really very different from what I majored in and my background. Now, after I graduated, I was inducted into the Phi Beta Cap Honor Society um, for um, uh, graduating the top 2% of my class. I graduated summa cum laude with honors and was awarded a, di a diploma with special distinction. Um, it was always my goal uh, in my career to, to really to go into academic, academics and research. Um, and so I applied to a number of universities and uh, wound up staying in Philadelphia and became a full-time professor at Jefferson. Uh, and while there, I published 15 peer-reviewed articles uh, in top-tier journals. Um, I taught an enormous number of undergraduate and graduate students. And um, I've always considered myself to have the mindset of a scientist, a teacher, and an academician. I've been an invited speaker internationally in many countries invited speaker domestically in many cities and I believe I've mentored close to 30,000 traders over the course of the last 12 years um, many of them in you know moderately sized uh, groups uh, maybe 275 to 300 
which is our master classes, and um, uh, and some of them one on one. Now, there is really a rigorous way that you need to go uh, through that ninety nine percent of investors. Um, uh, that has, that has, I'm not actually clear how, how this slide was written, but um, the, what you're going to see is something that has the potential to deliver norm, an enormous amount of success. The problem is, it is it, it, you really have to be very rigorous in your assessment. I'll show you exactly what it takes to hone in on a um, a small cap biotech that's going to rock it, and I'll show you my uh, track record for two and a half years, and it is really quite outstanding. Now, small cap biotech catalyst-driven stocks are what we're looking at. We want to buy, um, you know, not Biogen. Um, not any of these large biotech companies. We're, we're look, I mean, some of the uh, stocks that we pick are micro cap stocks, you know, all the way up to stocks that are maybe 50 or $60, but uh, market cap wise, um, they are really in the small cap division, all the way down to micro caps. Now, I'm going to review the process that, that the FDA uses. Sort of, I mean, this is going to be a little bit of an education um, in biology, and you're going to see how it dovetails into a tremendously powerful um, investing uh, thesis, uh, investing in an incredibly powerful way of taking great trades. Now, what we're going to look at is the drug approval process, and we have to know exactly what that is if we're going to understand um excuse me one second my son just texted me which he always does right in the middle Okay, I'm sorry. So what we're going to do is we look. We have to understand the drug approval process. Now the first thing is um, a biotech company will find a compound and they will examine it in the laboratory, and that's called preclinical uh, development. And they're going to gather a significant amount of data to show that this compound has significant efficacy in the laboratory against the specific disease or illness that they're looking to treat. And they will uh, provide that application um, to the FDA and they'll apply for an, what's called an IND, an investigational new drug um, application. Now in preclinical development, they can do whatever the heck they want. Um, you know, there, is, there are obviously no standards because this is all done in the laboratory. And obviously, they want to be humane, but they're going to be working in a Petri dish, and they may be working on mice, but they're not going to be working on people. Once they get an IND, that's when they go into early clinical phase study, and they look actually at its efficacy in um, uh, in volunteers. So in early clinical phase one, they're going to administer the medicine to try to, to, to determine early clinical efficacy, whether it works. But more importantly than whether or not it works, they're looking at its safety profile and its dosing interval. So really what they're looking at here are the pharmacokinetics of the medicine and whether the medicine is safe. 
Now, if at a low dose, the medicine causes hepatitis or it causes inflammation of the kidneys or inflammation of the lungs, obviously, no matter how clinically effective it may ultimately turn out to be, it's got to be discarded. So in phase one studies, it's, a, it's determined to be safe. And, and that's done at different, at different dosing intervals. The, pharma, the pharmacokinetics are obtained via blood. And uh, it's a lot of blood work, but these are paid volunteers. And um, a lot of people who are looking to earn a little bit of extra money will volunteer for a clinical phase one trial. Remember, these people do not have the disease. And what you want to be looking at is actually healthy people who don't have any underlying um, current clinical illnesses. Um, if everything goes well in the phase one trial, um, you're going to get approval to move on to phase two. Now, phase two is really a major event for most medicines because here you're looking at clinical efficacy. We already know it's safe. We know the dosing interval. And now we're going to be looking at early clinical efficacy. So these studies in phase two are done in a small cohort of patients, maybe a hundred patients. It's not a double blind placebo controlled study. Um, they simply take a hundred people, give them all the medicine and everyone gets the medication and they see if there's significant changes that show that the medicine has uh, significant clinical efficacy because it's not effective there's no sense in going on to a phase three trial now there's always a lot of complaints about the expense of these medicines and although i'm I, i'm not a proponent of, of some of the prices i i see because they're enormously high you you i i, I do understand that there are an enormous number of medicines that go into um, their preclinical, early clinical phase one, go to phase two and then fail. There's, I mean, actually it would astound you how many get that far and then can't go any further. So you, this is a really, really an incredibly expensive process. Now, eventually these companies are gonna find a medicine for a specific illness that's going to have efficacy and they're going to go on to a clinical phase three trial. Now, either phase two and or phase three are really the, the results of those studies um, and um, uh, the FDA response is what can send these stocks skyrocketing. Because in phase three, now in early clinical phase two, it could send the stock off to the moon. You show early clinical efficacy, efficacy in 100 patients um, in a disease that has no cure, I mean, that's going to send it rocketing. Same thing with, with phase three. Phase three is a very large study to show that the results that you get are statistically relevant. So it's going to be done against the placebo controlled cohort of patients. Uh, and you're going to know for sure that the results that you see are due to the medicine. At that point, you're going to apply to the, uh, to the FDA for a new drug application. And if they approve it, the medicine can be prescribed by doctors. It goes into the pharmacy. At that point, um, the stock should... To, you, you should, we, we're going to be in that stock way before that that period of time, um, but a clinical phase three approval is going to take the drug right into the pharmacy. So that's really what we're looking at. Now, there's a phase four study I've just mentioned briefly, and that is if there are multiple uh, medicines out there to treat the illness, 
then it goes head to head against those um, other medicines to show that it's the superior of all the others. But that's really not relevant to us. We are long gone on this medicine. Because that's not a catalyst event, looking at catalysts, and that's early clinical phase two and phase three. Now, I just wanted to give you an example, uh, just to really solidify how this process works and see how difficult it is really to, now every quarter, um, the FDA releases a, um, a, a laundry list of, of uh, companies and medicines, and they give you a date. It's called a PDUFA date. And on that date, they're, they're going to provide a medicine with a thumbs up or thumbs down. Obviously, the thumbs up is going to send it skyrocketing, and the thumbs down, I mean, may send the stock down 60, 65 percent, may send it down 70 percent. Um, so we're looking only for thumbs up from the FDA. So what a, um, a typical um, small cap biopharmaceutical, small cap, um, biopharmaceutical company is going to do, um, in this particular case, um, this is an illness that really had no uh, effective therapy. Now, I don't know if a lot of you know this, um, but um, stomach ulcers and 20% uh, of ulcers in the esophagus um, are caused or associated with a, an organism called Helicobacter pylori. Now, it's not there as an incidental finding. Helicobacter pylori actually causes the ulcer. So it's a back, the ulcer, 80% of ulcers in the stomach and 20% of ulcers in the esophagus are not caused by acid. They're caused by a bacteria. And at the time, there was very limited uh, medicines to treat it. Uh, the, the accepted standard of therapy was amoxicillin, but, which did eradicate it, but it was very quickly repopulated with the bacteria. So we were looking at an illness that causes significant morbidity, makes a lot of people sick. Uh, I mean, you can get a perforating ulcer um, and about 20% of these are associated ultimately with cancer, a uh, carcinoma of the stomach or esophagus. So it is of major relevance um, to put a dent in this disease. So. They looked at compounds and what they did, preclinical trials in a, in, a, um, in a lab. And what you can see is these are, these are the helicobacter pylori organisms. And these are actually are the organisms on a Petri dish that are grown in the lab. Um, now, I don't know what kind of agar they're growing on. Remember, remember each, each bacteria requires specific nutrients to grow optimally. Um, it's really irrelevant to our, to what we're discussing. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna drop multiple antibiotic discs. And you're gonna, you're gonna get a zone of clearing around each disc. Now, the bigger the zone of clearing, the higher the efficacy rate is against killing the bacteria in a Petri dish. It doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work in someone's stomach, but it, it's the only way to start. So they found a medicine that had significant efficacy against treating Helicobacter pylori. They provided their results to the FDA and they got uh, approval to start phase one trials. So I'm not gonna go through this because this is really what I already discussed. So in the phase one study, they gave this medicine to patients, not necessarily looking so much at efficacy. In fact, really not worrying about efficacy at all, but looking at safety and dosing schedules. And the medicine is a pill. It's not intravenous, it's not intramuscular. Um, and uh, 
this medicine was incredibly safe. Now we're gonna focus our attention on two classes of medicines. Um, and they are gonna be med medicines that have um, fast track status. In other words, if the FDA perceives that there's a, that there's a really major need uh, for this medicine to reach the pharmacy, they will fast track the medicine. And a lot of companies apply for fast track status and get denied. And we're also gonna look for what we call, it's called orphan drug status. And that is we're treating an illness that currently has no cure or no effective treatment at all. Now, in that particular tract, we're already sort of select, sort of starting to select out, say there's 35 medicines that are coming up before the FDA for approval in a given quarter, we're only gonna specifically pay attention to those given fast track approval and are, and are looking to treat an illness that has no cure or, or no palliative therapy. So phase one trials did really well. Phase two trials, they actually worked against the ulcer and it healed. Um, now the effic efficacy side effects, just several hundred patients. Um, based on this, they were given fast track status. Now the fast track status, since we were already in this medicine pop this stock heavy because when the medicine is awarded fast track status investors are paying attention to this particular subsector um are going to pile in so um these were based on interim results and again there's no long-term effective therapy for pep we, we, we you know for peptic ulcer disease so now we're gonna to go to phase three trials. Now phase two is a catalyst event, phase three is a catalyst event. Here we're gonna be looking at the efficacy and side effect of hundreds to thousands of patients. Um, now I wrote unlikely catalyst event, and in this particular case, remember, the major catalyst event was already in phase two. I mean, all the early investors are here, and that's where we were in this stock when it received fast track status. I mean, when you get, it's rare to get fast track status. And it's, and when it's also orphan drug status, that's the catalyst. So we're gonna be in it already. Now phase three obviously makes us feel really good because the medicine showed itself to be extremely effective in the treatment of, of peptic helicobacter uh, associated um, uh, peptic ulcer disease. Now, as I said, phase four is a double blind placebo controlled study, hundreds to thousands of patients. And this is where we're looking at um, a, a statistically significant difference comparing two different medicines. Obviously, when you have an orphan drug, you cannot do a phase four trial. So if a new drug earns fast track designation, its developer gets loads of help with the FDA. Now, here's really a key thing to know. And that is when the, when the FDA provides you with fast track status, they sort of take you under their wing and baby you through the, uh, the completion of your phase two and the completion of the phase three. Because many, many um, medicines are rejected for insufficient data uh, or a, a poor selection of demographics um, because of methodological flaws in the study. But that is, cannot happen in a fast track medicine 
because the FDA is already providing you with all the guidelines they're looking for in order to get the medicine approved. Essentially, they're saying, we want this medicine approved. Here's the roadmap. Just follow what we're telling you, and we're going to give you um, approval. And it's going to get an accelerated priority review, and very likely the FDA is going to give you a thumbs up. So we want fast-tracked medicines that are orphan drugs. Now, we give it orphan drug status, not anyone else. But it's, it's, it's pretty obvious whether it is or not. It, it's easy to determine whether or not um, that a medicine that an illness, a medicine is used to treat an illness that has no has no um, therapy, and we're looking for medicines that, between me and my colleagues, have a 95% chance chance of success or greater, and we make that determination late or early in the phase two study. Now I have to tell you that I I do this service along with four, three professors at the University of Miami School of Medicine. I mean, I'm in South Florida. Uh, I'm about 20 miles from the University of Miami. And I could not do this without their help. Um, I have expert in, in, in certain particular fields. I mean, one uh, neurology professor who, who's a genius, another uh, immunology, um, and another in cardiology. And uh, without their background and, and help, it'd be very, very for me to do this on my own. So we sort of meet in our little committee. And these are all things that I, I invest in. Um, and when I recommend it, I'm in at the same price you are. And all of these professors are in at the same price. Because I rely on them to a significant degree to help me pick the best biotech, they rely on me to pick the best way to, to format the trade. Now a CRL letter is, 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 is sort of uh, the stake through the heart of, this, of, of, of the medicine. If you get a complete response letter, it means that the FDA has given you a thumbs down and they're giving you all the reasons why they are denying this medicine. So the last thing we want to see is a CRL letter. In two and a half years of this service, we have only gotten one CRL letter. So I have only called one medicine in two and a half years as likely to be approved by the FDA, and it was denied. So that's a pretty amazing track record. Now, I'm going to show you some of the medicines that, that, that um, I've done. Now, um, one was Novavax's um, RSV vaccine, res respiratory syncytial virus. It's a major um, problem for children and for people with underlying immunological disorders and for people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. If you have a normal immune system, uh, even with, uh, with diabetes and you don't have any of these underlying um, illnesses, um, RS infection with respiratory syncytial virus is nothing more than a flu-like illness but RSV kills a lot of people with, uh, who have these uh, um, underlying problems. Right where that green line is or the green arrow, that's where it receives its fast track status. That's where we got in. Um, the stock went up 125%. We made 364% on the option on Novavax. Now this is Regeneron. They made ILEA. Um, this is breakthrough therapy, fast track designation, right there on that green arrow. Um, there was no disease, there was no medicine at the time to treat senile macular degeneration. 
And it's quite common as you get older. Um, at the time, people were living um, longer and longer. It's only been in the last 10 years that our actually our longevity rate or our, our, our longevity is starting to diminish. But as we live longer and longer, you see more and more senile macular degeneration. It's a horrible disease. It robs you of your 20-20 uh, vision. It can take you all the way down to 2400 or light perception only. First medicine, orphan drug status, the stock went up 55%, the option 157%. Uh, Clovis Oncology, made Rubraca. I see it on television all the time. It's for ovarian cancer. Um, it, it, it wasn't a novel treatment for a, ovarian cancer, but it received fast track approval because it was uh, considered to have major advantages over everything on the market um, at the time. It was, an oncol it was an immunologic medicine based on a cytotoxic medicine. And I don't want to get too technical. It's taken me years to get to this point, but there are two types of therapy for cancer. One is cytotoxic. It kills the cells directly of the, of the tumor. The other is one that incites an immune response. It tar excuse me, that targets the cancer cells. Rubaca was the first treatment for ovarian cancer that selected, that selectively did it via an immunological mechanism was much safer, much better tolerated, and much more effective. 120% on the stock, 302% on the option. Uh, United Therapeutics, this was not a big winner, but this was for pediatric brain cancer. Um, now, a voucher is really you know, at the time I called, I called it that when I first made this webinar, that is fast track status for unit toxin approval. Um, I obviously got approved, the stock roared. We made 57% on the option. Now we're gonna take an option every chance that we get uh, unless the options chain is completely inert. Now lately we've, unfortunately been faced with that and we had to actually buy the stock. Now I'm going to show you our open positions and when you see the trajectory of these stocks I think you're going to be a little bit shocked at how they have rocketed to the upside. Now it would have, it would have been a lot better to trade the option but you cannot trade an option that essentially has no open interest and no volume. You just can't do it. It's impossible to get in and it's impossible to liquidate. Uh, the market makers can't figure out what the midpoint is. And I, listen, I've tried it before and it is really just, it's just, it's, it's a nightmare. So we're, in those particular cases, we're gonna have to trade the stock. Now, I just wanna show you how these, you, you, you get these when you get your newsletter. Now, this is BioXL Therapeutics. And BioXL therapy, this is coming right from the newsletter I wrote, where um, the drug was granted breakthrough therapy and fast track designation for the, for the uh, acute treatment of agitation associated with schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, and dementia. Now, agitation is a major, major problem with um, uh, schizophrenia and, and, all, and all of these psych uh, you know, psychiatric illnesses. And I gave it a 98% along with my colleagues chance of success. Um, that is above that 95% threshold. We had fast track status. Um, I, I can't remember if this was, um, uh, if this was administered via biofilm that went over the top of your skin, but we took a May 2020 $15 call uh, that cost three dollars and ninety cents, and it went up. This this is it right here. I mean, the more recent ones are not quite as elegantly formatted. We made a hundred eighty-two percent because not only do you look at the size of the move, 
but you look at the rate that the stock fires to the upside because that increases implied volatility on the option and really expands its value. Um, so we got a four buck or was a, almost a $6 move on a $16 stock with an enormous expansion of, uh, of volatility, it made 182%. Acer Therapeutics, here's exactly what I sent out in the newsletter, my mouse here. Um, now Acer developed a medication and I wanna, I don't wanna sort of bog you down in this, but I wanna show you how the process works. Um, and it was used to treat maple syrup urine disease. Now I actually Googled maple syrup urine disease, looked at young children who had it. And let me tell you, it was so horrific that I almost had nightmares about it. You see a one or two year old kid with maple syrup disease, I mean, it's hor horrible. And what it is, it, it, it's a problem with the, uh, with the urea cycle. And remember, urea creates blood urea nitrogen, and that's what you excrete in your urine. And if you ever ask your doctor, you know, how's your, how's your kidney function? Then they give you a number, and that's your BUN, your blood urea nitrogen. And that tells you how much, um, uh, urea is being excreted in your urine and of a really good amount is excreted, your kidneys are functioning well. Well, these patients can't get rid of it. And so it develops, it, it goes into the blood, the brain and bones. It was an orphan drug status and, and fast tracked. And it's really, you know, it's not common um, and I don't know what they charged for it, but let me tell you, remember another thing about um, these medicines. If you start a patient, say at age two, on treatment and extend their life 25 years, they're gonna have to take that drug for 25 years. So although there may be a small amount of patients on it, they're gonna be on it for life and the medicine, this particular medicine extended their lives enormously. At the time, it was really unknown how long they would live because the medicine hadn't been around long enough, but it was anticipated it would be a couple of decades. So here's what happened with the stock. It went up right here, 101%. Now what commonly happens is after the catalyst event, we've seen the stock just drift off. And that's all right. We're only riding it up. Um, we, already have, we already have our first and second targets set. I know what we're looking for. I mean, that's what these professors are looking for me to do. We were out at 101%, and this drift down doesn't matter. Now, Amelix uh, developed a novel treatment. In fact, it was the only treatment for Lou Gehrig's disease for amyotropic lateral sclerosis. Lou Gehrig's disease is a horrific disease. Until this time, it had no treatment. It leads to muscle atrophy, weakness, respiratory failure, and death. You just wind up disintegrating. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know a better way to put it. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you lose your musculature, your movement, uh, it's hard to breathe and wind up on a ventilator in the ICU, and ultimately you die. This has really changed this dismal prognosis significantly. Got approved, it had huge efficacy. I'm not gonna go into any more information, and there's where it shot the stock up, 147, 147% on the option. And you can see this, huge spike in volume on the uh, gap. We were in the stock before the gap and just rode it up for 147%. Amicus, um, I have to just remember it. Oh, it was to treat Pompey's disease. Now Pompey's disease is a glycogen storage disease 
when you take in um, food, ultimately everybody has all their food broken down to glucose. The glucose is sort of the energy um, machine of the body. Now, to those of us who exercise, maybe do a little uh, weightlifting or stretching or walking or running, some of that glucose is going to be deposited as muscle. And um, if we exercise a lot, we're going to burn a lot of it off. Um, but a lot of it is just stored as glycogen. Now, glycogen is sort of the storage energy uh, deposits that the body uses. You know, I mean, going back 100,000 years, there would be something sudden that sudden that happened to the to the Neanderthal man, and they would need a, a significant amount of energy that they could use quickly. And they would mobilize these glycogen vacuoles that were filled with glucose. Well, if you have Pompey's disease, you can't use them. So they get deposited in muscle, they build up these huge vacuoles, and they just lay there. So, I mean, it's really a multi-system failure. It, it, I mean, you get multi-organ system failure, um, and it is just really another horrific disease. And um, I'm trying to find the, the name of their medicine. I thought I'd put it in here. It's really not that important. Oh, it's ATGAA. I mean, that is the generic name of their medicine. And here's how the stock resulted on its uh, approval. Boom. I didn't put in the I didn't even put in the percentage there. Now, here is my results from 2021. 2021, I had 20 trades and I only had two losers. One for 82%, one for 9%. And all these as winners. Now the thing I only the, the thing I did in 2020 in 2021 actually this is 2021 um, was just track the percentage move of the stock. I didn't put in the percentage move of the option. Now obvi you know obviously if I was a uh, you know uh, into hype and wanted to show you like you know 20 million percent. I would opt. I would have opted the other way, but I decided to simply look at the at the percent move of the underlying stock as a very reasonable way um, of assessing uh, its performance. That was a hundred thirteen percent move in the stock. Now I don't remember how much we made on the option. I don't want to quote it, but it was in the six hundred percent area. Now. There's, I, I mean, I'm going to bring to your attention, there is always one caveat that the FDA approval, it, it very rarely happens, but we have to watch out for it, is that the stock will rise into the FDA approval because it's got fast track status, it's got orphan drug status, then the FDA will approve it and the stock will fall like a rock. Now, it doesn't happen often. It happened to me. Uh, at the beginning of uh, of last year, I will, I'll show it to you. And that was on a medication because investors did not feel that the medicine would really be utilized. And I'll tell you what the medicine was. It was really a novel, wonderful therapy, but they just didn't think it would get out there um, because it's, it tends, it's, it's a treatment for hepatitis B, but people are ordinarily not screened for it. 90% of the population doesn't have any idea whether hepatitis B positive or negative. And um, that's the problem. They just didn't think it was going to um, uh, reach the bottom line of the company. But in general, you can see the percentage here. Now, this is early, this is early 2022, and I may have left out some of my 2022s. These are all winners, these are all stock percentages. Now, here's my 2022. Now, these 
are options percentages. Now, I had three losers in 2022. Um, now, one of these uh, losers, and I, I'm not sure which one it was, was the hepatitis B medicine. Now, normally, hep I do, I'm just not sure which, which um, you know, let me tell you, I, I, I sit here and uh, go through uh, clinical data on so many medicines that they all begin to um, get, get a little uh, a vague in my head. But um, um, it was actually two medicines that happened on because I called one medicine wrong. Um, and that was the only FDA uh, decision I called that blew up on me. It was a treatment for, um, for Parkinson's disease. Uh, all the data was absolutely outstanding and it got denied. And um, on one of these medicines, um, it was it was a hepatitis B medicine. Normally, you needed two injections, and it targeted one antigen. This you needed you needed only one injection, and it targeted three antigens on the hepatitis B on the surface of the hepatitis B. It was far more effective, far less cumbersome because you didn't have to come back to the office again. Yet investors did not look upon it as being anything over the top and man did they dump that stock and, and we just we were just had to watch it in free fall now i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna show you our open positions in 2023 now i have to tell you that um uh i we i, I have i've personally learned a lot about um trading now here they are um the first one is sidara and i'm gonna put that up uh, let me get the ticker. Uh, CDTX. Now, we've been in this stock for quite some time. Um, I'm going to, I thought I had this reformatted already. I think this is the one that I reformatted. It's over here. But let me drop this and bring this chart over. Um, let me get the ticker again, um, the CDTX. Now, these are open positions. Now, CDTX was a stock that we got in all the way at the, actually cheaper than this. We have to go out even further and even further than this. We got into this stock at a buck 30. Right around here. It's trading at a buck 35 here. Actually, even more. We've been in this stock a while. Well, we're in all the way down here. And it, today, uh, I don't know where it's going to close. It's trading at $2.03 right now. That's where it closed. So it's gone from a buck 35 to 203. We don't own the option. And the reason we don't own the option on the stock, it was when we bought, it was only a buck 35. And the option chain is deader than a doornail. You wanna to try to trade this on an option, good luck. Because I, I, if I remember correctly, open interest was zero. Um, so obviously the volume was zero and the difference between the bid and the ask was, was like, you know, enormous. Just recommended to buy the stock under a buck 35 and we're, we're sitting at a stock that traded up to 210 today. This stock is going to, I have a 12 month target on it of $5. It's got multiple catalysts. It's got an immunological platform um, that produces uh, monoclonal antibodies against specific tumors. And it has done absolutely remarkably um, against the tumors that have been, um, that it, it has targeted. It's got two 
or are three additional catalyst events for 2023. And I think by the time all is said and done, this will be a $5 stock. We are just sitting and holding it. Our next one is Lantheus. This is a terrific stock. Again, I just couldn't buy the option. We were in way before the gap. I don't know the exact price we got in at. Um, right around here. Oops, I don't want to open that up anymore. Um, but what Lantheus does, it's also got, <clears throat> excuse me, a huge catalyst. The, PDUA, the FDA has not announced the date yet, but you can see the way it's trading into the catalyst event. They have unique diagnostic imaging that looks at the heart. And the, the diagnostic, diagnostic imaging it does at some point is anticipated may replace a stress test because it has the ability to look inside the coronary arteries look at the function, not just statically, uh, but dynamically in many, many ways to tell you um, actually the uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressure. I mean, it actually does an unbelievable number of things. So it's a company that is focused on diagnostic Im imaging of the heart and it's a pioneer and up it's, up it's going. And then stock number three, we just got in, is Trevere TVTX. There's one more. Now, TVTX, this is what I learned. And this is what we did on TVTX. Let me go to the right edge here. Um, and let me spread this out a little bit. On TVTX, we had it long because it created the first medicine. On, on the announcement of the FDA approval, the stock went up 18%. And we finished, finished the trade. Then it's, I saw it consolidating at the $22 to $23 level, and I put in a trade to sell it. And we are riding it now short. So now I'm learning to leverage it. There are certain stocks who get propelled. A lot of the momentum guys come flying in and they only want to ride it up. And if it doesn't have like Sidara re repetitive catalysts, it's going to come back down 10 to 15 percent. Um, Sidara with um, TVTX was down nicely today. I think it's going to take a nice dump for a lot more than it, than it has already. That's position three. Now position four is Coherus. I left it for last because it's the one that has done nothing yet. And the reason it's done nothing, which we don't really care about, we didn't write it down. Um, actually we did. We wrote it up and we wrote it down. Um, we've been in it a while. We're down about 5% on the stock. I had to buy the stock because the option chain, was, again, was horrible. Now, even if you, I, I, I tell my traders, even if you buy 25 shares or 50 shares, at least get a great ROI. I'm not, listen, I take all these trades, and I have three professors who take these trades, and there's no way I'm going to give out a trade on an inert option chain. So we're sitting at a small loss, um, but Coherus is, an, uh, is waiting for its FDA approval. Now, I think it'll start trading up. Again, we have no specific date, except to know that it will be between now and, um, let's see, March, April, May, June, July, and September. So we have a range. I always like to get into these early. I don't care about the 5% loss. It'll start trading up. 
This has got a 99% chance of approval. It's another immunological platform. Um, there's something that's expressed on the surface of every tumor cell. It's called a PD antigen. And this makes uh, an antibody against it. And it has shown, amazing, I think Romuflast was the last medicine that it got approved. And that was for really refractory nasopharyngeal carcinoma. I mean, it treats brutally difficult uh, illnesses and it does so effectively. While they've got another medicine coming out, I don't, you know what, I can't even remember the tumor that it's gonna treat, but it's a very common one. Um, and in preclinical uh, phase two studies, it did absolutely spectacular. So those are the four positions we're sitting in. Now you can see from this that it's a lot of work to get these positions and as a normal investor like myself, I need the help of really, I mean, the, right now it's immunology. I mean, that is a major breakthrough field because immunology is not only curing cancer, um, I think it's gonna start curing bacterial infections it's going to be effective against autoimmune disorders. I'm, t you know, I personally believe that's the forefront. And I look for it for for um for companies with um, immunological platforms that have really shown signs of significant efficacy, because they they usually wind up doing exceedingly well. Obviously, these are risky, but we've already put something down on the table. It's got fast track status. So we know the FDA loves the medicine and we know the medicine will not be denied because of a flaw in the methodology of the study because the FDA has written it and the, the pharmaceutical company is gonna follow it. Because some of these are small biotechs and you know they spend a significant amount of money to get these things uh, marketed and they don't want them to fail. So that's where we are. I'm gonna drop this. So I'm just gonna give you the price. Now it's 997 per year. And it's, I, I have to give you a, a performance guarantee. If I can't get you 10, um, I didn't put it in here, but you see on the landing page, 10 um, three digit winners, 100% or more in a given year, you can ask for your money back. I'm, I mean, most of these trades uh, on, on a catalyst event fly well past 100%. I mean, we, we, we just got a 101% trade, but if, if I can't do that, um, even though we're 11 months or 12 months out, I will be more than happy to return your money. I am so positive I'm going to be doing well. Now I have a three-year track record, and I've only called, along with my colleagues, one stock wrong. I told you that uh, the one thing we have to be careful of is that uh, investors don't see that for approval as bringing the company any net money to the bottom line. I put that on my to list to make sure that the medicine will be looked upon as bringing significant money into the company so that they're going to make bank on it. And that, and again, remember the, with the knock against the hepatitis medicine, you get a shot and you're gone. But on these immunological medicines, you're, treat, you're in treatment for life. On these neurological disorders, in treatment for life. On these psychiatric disorders, you're in treatment for life. On these oncological disorders, I mean, these are all very sad illnesses, um, tumors, you're gonna be in treatment for the balance of your life. So these, they're high priced medicines and many people have to be treated for their entire, for their entire life. Now for the first 10 to come aboard, you're gonna get my tiny company, that I believe I had, I'm invested in it. 
um, and it's responsible. I, it's going to be a medical revolution. I could do a webinar on what is coming. Um, and the only reason I know it is I sit down with these professors and because I've done a lot of reading. Now, I subscribe to Medline. Um, it's an expensive service, but allows you to do a world literature search for every single um, study that's been published on a specific medicine. So to save them the trouble, I do the Medline. So if there are 12 papers published for preclinical data from, from phase one and phase two, I print them all out, I read them myself, bring them to these guys, and we all sit down and make an evaluation. Bonus two is Apple's chip maker. Bonus one and bonus two, the companies are very, are sort of synergistically poised off of this huge breakthrough. I'm telling you, I know you, you hear about it all the time. You know, this company sitting on a $99 trillion business. This one is really coming. And um, bonus three is our bi-weekly small biotech update, personal sessions that we do. So um, now the biotech alerts, um, anytime I come across a new medicine, you're going to get an alert. We're always going to do a Sunday night recap of all our open positions. That's sort of that is sort of my um, my flagship evening where I sit down and go over every open position, you know, um, and we evaluate when the PDUFA date is, how the price is moving, everything behind it. Remember, I have never in the lifetime of this service been with three stocks normally i have multiple open options positions and that's what this service is about it's really about offering you options and i said on any uh, now i, I just I, I i just want to add really quickly that on this trade here uh, i put it here i'm sorry just, it would, I think it might be of interest to you. TVTX. Now, when I traded this long, here's TVTX to the downside. Now, when I traded this stock long, I had to trade the stock because there just wasn't anyone in it. It had orphan drug status to treat Berger's disease which is IgA nephropathy. It causes end-stage renal disease, and all these patients wind up on dialysis. Dialysis is unbelievably expensive. You better believe that the FDA had a major impetus in getting this medicine approved. But obviously, you still need the clinical efficacy, efficacy results, but to keep a person off dialysis saves Medicare, Medicaid, billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, but the short position, I was able to take a put because traders just like me, just trading normally, um, they're not looking at the, at the catalysts, saw the stock popping out after a big move up and they got in short to the downside. Now, I don't know if I got in here or here, I don't really remember, but we got in early and we're riding the stock down. So this one is an option, the other three are stocks, and I'm gonna to try to give you all stocks. So let me answer any questions. And I have little things here. And let me just go to the offer. Now, if you think it's pricey, I'm telling you, one winner will make the, the, the cost of this quarterly service, even yearly service, will pay for it. Because these winners are not small in general. In general, we get three digit winners. If you, if you risk two or 300 bucks, um, 
you have the opportunity while you risk four or five hundred you you uh, you know you if you make a hundred percent I mean you're really in good shape and we rarely take a loser and I've showed you every trade going back two and a half years I can't be more transparent than that let me go to questions hey good afternoon everyone hold on Okay. How do you find the percentage that they think the stock will get? You know what, uh, Peter? That's really based on an assessment that I make with the three professors based on a, a compendium of all the information. Um, we ha Obviously, there's really no formula, fixed formula that we use. Uh, but you know we, we've added one factor, and that is money to the bottom line of the company that we never did before. So now we're never going to give a COS or chance of success of 98 or 99 percent unless we believe it's going to make the company a lot of money. But it, it's really a subjective assessment, but it comes from three brilliant professors in their field. They're well published and they're brilliant and myself as an investor um who has to get us in and out of the position and i do a lot of reading myself i mean i learned, learned a lot of medicine um I, you know i can't uh 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 provide you with antibiotics to treat uh the, to treat anything but i i mean i know so much about pompey's disease and burger's disease it's unbelievable how much i've learned but that's really what it is it's it's a very it is subjective, um, but we what we have a lot of criteria, you know, efficacy of phase two studies, orphan drug status, fast track status, all things like that. Hang on, let me scroll back up again here. Hey, David. Sure, David. We'll send out a link to everybody who who is here. Yeah, no, a lot of the, a lot of these medicines, we are so positive will get approved. We give it a 99% chance of approval. We call it now chance of success, COS. But the last few medicines we've taken have been 98 or 99% COS. I mean, I think the chance that these are going to get denied based on their um, preclinical data is just so slim that that's where we put the, uh, the chance of approval. It is exceedingly high. And, and let me tell you, we've had some gift trades. And I'll just tell you one really quickly, because if you're here, you're, you're, you're still here, you're very interested in the service. Um, the second generation Botox medicine was approved by the FDA, and then they could not uh, examine the facility because of COVID. Now, the Botox medicine was not made in the United States. I believe it was made in China, which is where all our medicines come from. So they, they held up formal approval, and the medicine did not go up, I mean, this underlying stock didn't go up. Well, that came to my attention when I reviewed all of the medicines coming up for a PDUFA. I already had a pre-approved medicine and the FDA had now done its due diligence on its um, manufacturing facilities. And you may hate the fact that these medicines are farmed out to China, but China does a very, very good job in manufacturing them. They're pure, um, they're terrific medicines. Unfortunately, they do a great job at, at creating the precursors of fentanyl too, but they do a great job at that. That would, if I would, I, I, we don't go higher than 99, but that would have been a 99.9999 chance of success. And of course it was approved. And let me tell you, I threw the, I threw the, uh, I mean, I mean, I threw the baby in the bath water at that trade. 
uh, because I just felt that there was no chance. Obviously, I didn't risk my whole my whole uh, trading account on it. But let me tell you, I disproportionately weighted that trade, and I made it a lot of money. And we get trades like that. Um, they come up where technical issues impede the ability of the FDA to approve it, and they preliminary approve the medicine. And there's another one I just can't remember, um, but it happens. On average, how long does it take for a position to play out? You know what, David? It all depends upon um, uh, how many uh, catalysts there are. Now, I like I like to take a medicine about six weeks uh, prior to the catalyst date, and the catalyst date is going to be uh, the approval of fast track status. We know the application is in. And they give out the date that they're going to say yes or no. So um, if we believe that it's going to, it's got a high chance, we're going to be in. But that's a catalyst event. We're going to be in about about six weeks before. And the reason is that I I like to think we're the first ones in, and then a lot of traders start to buy into it as they start hearing about it. And in general, the underlying stocks tends to, tends to trend up. We want to be the first ones in. Now, Sidara, that we bought at a buck 35, that I think closed at over two bucks today, is going to have multiple catalyst events throughout 2023. Now, it's trading at two. I am, listen, there's no guarantee, but I believe it will trade to $5 by December 31st of 2023. It will go from a, our entry, you know, you know, I said buy under a buck 35. I got in under a buck 35, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna bag and tag it as an entry at a buck 35. I mean, I mean a buck 35 to five bucks. Um, we're gonna stay in that trade for the whole year. But in general, these trades evolve pretty quickly, about a month to a month and a half. We get in any later, we won't be the first investors in, um, and if, and we don't want to go further out because there's you know there's too much too much volatility further out. I really after two and a half years of experience, I found that is the best you know the best window. No no problem, David. Now orphan drug status, Peter, just means that it it is a medicine that is geared to treat an illness that has no current cure. Or, or even even no current no current palliative therapy. So for Berger's disease, which is IgA nephropathy, no treatment whatsoever. Now none of these are cures. Um, the medicine to treat uh, Pompe's disease. It's not a cure, but it makes patients significantly better. And since there was no treatment for burgers, no treatment for pompies, these are orphan drug status medicines. And that's what we're looking for. I mean, early, early on, um, I, I mean, I took it myself because, I mean, on, on a whim, and I will never do it again, because it's sitting in my, in my portfolio as one of the biggest losers I have. Um, there was a medicine, I read the preclinical data, I went over it with everyone. Uh, I didn't recommend it because I was a little bit scared of it, but it, but it was an antibiotic um, that outed ciprofloxacin or Cipro in the treatment of non-complicated urinary tract infections in women. I mean, it beat it by a mile and all, all the, um, the gram-negative organisms like E. coli, uh, Klebsiella and all these organisms that uh, just um, sort of made made a joke of Cipro, it beat to death. And what did the FDA do? They denied the medicine. But what they did was they didn't deny it outright. They sent it back because they want additional clinical data. And so it set the medicine back a year and a half. Now it's it's still got fast track status um, because uncomplicated UTIs in women are are a big problem 
and um, it's got tremendous clinical efficacy, but now it's gone to 18 months. That's how long they're, they're going to be required. So the, when you've got an ant, when you've got a medicine like um, like this, that's good, that's used to treat an illness that already has a dozen therapies. I mean, you can use Cipro, you can use Bactrim, you can use amoxicillin. I mean, I mean, there's a hundred thousand antibiotics. That's when you start to develop danger, and that's why I didn't recommend it in the newsletter. How often and why did you short a position after receiving? Because David, a lot of times, remember, there's two types of investors out there. There are investors like you and I that are in this because we believe in the efficacy of the medicine. And we're gonna be in a lot, we're gonna be in really early. And then there are other traders who are out there with their scanners. So they see this thing as making this big leap. So what do they do? They pile in and they pile in and they create this enormous move to the upside that it really overdoes it. There's, and, the, and the stock becomes way overbought, which is great for us. I call them the Momo traders, the momentum traders. And now we're out because we have our first and second targets fixed, filled, and we're gone. But when the stock makes um, a 50, 60, 70% leap up, the stock, not the option, it's going to drift down. And I've been watching this now for two years. I've never taken them short. Trevere is the first one I have, but I'm going to start doing that because they inevitably, these investors bail out right away. If they did, if, they, if, they, if the ones at the top are already crushed, uh, and um, there's going to be a big pile out, and we're going to ride the stock down maybe 10%. And if we're in right at the top and um, we buy an at the money uh, call, we're going to make a nice amount of money on it. Uh, the the, the Trevier is only a one month position, um, and I was almost thinking of taking it on two weeks. But the week, there are, I remember there are, no, there are no weeklies, but even on the weeklies, I, uh, the short, the puts, there was decent open interest. So I'm going to start looking at that very carefully because I think we can get a great move to the upside and then a lot of these drift down. Well, but, but I'm going to do so very cautiously. Because like, like I told you, I trade them with my own money. And if anyone wants to challenge it, I'll send them my think or swim print out, I would simply redact a number of contracts and uh, my account number, and I'll show you that I take every trade I'm in at the same price you are. Um, uh, okay, hey Dave, hey Peter, which type diseases need lifelong management? Well, basically, almost all of them do, Peter. Remember that if you've got orphan drug status on an immunological disorder, um, or a metabolic disorder. Take a metabolic disorder. There are a million of them, um, but let's just call call Pompe's disease. That Pompe's disease exists because there's a genetic problem in the part in the coding of these patients. They don't make. Remember Pompe's? I looked for the, I looked for the name of the medicine, and the medicine was called AT slash G E E. Well, the medicine is sort of um, giving the patients the, um, the genetic code in a way to start making the enzyme that starts breaking down glycogen. And these patients have to be on that for life. That's a factor in our chance of success. You've known that um, right from the start. Now, um, if you have schizophrenia, or you have bipolar illness, you're, and, and, and it's a medicine to either make it better, or you have a Parkinson's disease, you're going to be on it for life. It's unfortunate if you have a tumor, and, and this prolongs life, you could be on it two, three, four, five years. 
The only medicine that crapped out on me, excuse my language, was the hepatitis B one shot, which was a major therapeutic breakthrough. And the investors just said, eh, we don't care. And the company's way down. At some point, I'm going to revisit it. Um, but they need to do a lot of due diligence in getting it out to the primary care doctors and telling them, look, screen for hepatitis B. It's killing a lot of patients. And we got a one-shot cure. There's a lot of doctors just don't include that in their basic immuno, in their basic, they do a CBC and a Chem 18. And they do not look at hepatitis B or C. Um, and if you don't have inflamed liver enzymes and you don't have to have them to have hepatitis B, they don't, they don't look any further. So there's an enormous amount of undiagnosed hep B. And 25 years after you get the infection, you wind up with cirrhosis. And that's when it comes to clinical attention. And then it's too late because you need a liver transplant. And it's really sad. Okay, I hope I answered your question, Peter. Hey, David, how important is it for a physician to receive FDA approval? No, it's got to get FDA approval, David. Emergency use only is not good enough. Now, unfortunately, COVID, I believe, got emergency use and not FDA approval, but that's a one in a century. That's one in, that's one in a thousand years. And that was a lot of politics behind that. We want an FDA approval because that's going to give the medicine longevity uh, in, the, in the pharmacy, and it's, and it's going to really push the bottom line of the underlying company up. Traders are going to want to buy that company. Look at Sedara. I mean, it was up today, I think, 15 or 16 percent on no news. I mean, nothing came out today. And it went from a buck 70 to two dollars. I'm looking around, but what happened? Why did that? People are starting to take notice of it. And they're starting to take notice of the fact of what's coming up. And I'm telling you, Sadar is going to trade up to five bucks before we close it out. Now, not every position is as, is, as, is as successful, but I mean, I'm running a 90% plus track record here. Does the FDA have a website? listing the status of the upcoming drugs and what they don't, Peter. I ha what I do is I have to subscribe. It's unfortunate. Um, now, TD Ameritrade has does have it, but to get it from TD Ameritrade is very, very um, unwieldy. So for me to get it, I have to subscribe to a data-related service I prescribed to Benzinga. And Benzinga gives you, um, it's very good for this, service if you want to try to anticipate yourself because it does you can filter out all the other noise just focus in on small biocap fda you know major announcements and then every quarter benzinga will publish and you know benzinga will give up will give it a uh, a red star or banner when the fda publishes its list of medicines up for pdufa up for approval um, for the three months. And there are going to be medicines that span out over those entire 90 days. Hey, listen, David, Medicare has to cover it, but we're looking at medicines that are absolutely are well going to get Medicare coverage. I mean, we're looking at orphan drug medicines. I mean, how can Medicare not cover or Medicaid not cover uh, Pompey's disease? or not cover Berger's disease. But, and remember, a lot of these medicines save Medicare and Medicaid a huge amount of money. I mean, if um, uh, Berger's disease um, is um, halted and the patient doesn't go on dialysis, it saves them. So now, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how much dialysis costs, but I bet it costs a million dollars a year per patient. It's so unbelievably expensive. It's really unbelievable. So they're gonna embrace these medicines 
big time. They really, really are. Um, that's also something that we discuss, whether they're likely to get Medicare, Medicaid approval. We're looking at medicines that absolutely must be, and 90% of the time they actually make um, the, the amount of money that Medicare, Medicaid pays out less. You develop a medicine that cures a tumor or puts a patient into remission that just saves them money, especially if it's an oral medication. They just got to do it. I mean, none of these do not get approved. And those are, that was a great question, I have to tell you. You're the first person that's ever asked that. They were all good questions today, but no one's ever asked me about Medicare and Medicaid. And it's a big deal. Medicare didn't embrace recent. Well, I don't know, David, and I, 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 I don't want to um, give you um, uh, erroneous information, but I don't know the efficacy of the medicine. Um, I do not know anything about it. Uh, so I really can't say, and I, I, I just don't know. I mean, if it was super effective, they had to, but if it was wishy-washy and every now and then a wishy-washy med gets through, I mean, the FDA is still, are, are still human. They're very political and it's really disgraceful. Um, and we, we also take that into account that there's certain medicines that have political impetus to be approved. And that's a huge factor as well. What do you think of the new quant computer for gathering worldwide data? Peter, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I really don't. I mean, we do Nexus Lexus searches um, and that's that's about as far as we go in terms of that. But I'm the wrong guy to, to, to ask about, you know, about sophisticated computer. I mean, I read about quantum computing all the time, but I don't really know the, the, the nuts and bolts of it. And I, I don't want to I don't want to start talking about something I don't know nothing about. And, and listen, my ability to understand all of this is also limited. I read an enormous amount. I mean, it really is cumbersome to me because the medicines that I see have orphan drug status and fast track approval coming up for FDA approval. I got to pull all the papers before I can bring them to these professors. They don't want to sift through junk. I mean, I got to present them sort of like the uh, filet mignon. So that's my job, or they're not going to work with me. So it really is a lot of due diligence on my part. And um, it's very, very labor. You know, there's no way to reduce the amount of time it takes. And I really sit every night going through papers, but they're fascinating. And I, I you know, I really get into them. And um, you'll, you'll find that there's just not that much info. There's the phase one, phase two trials, you know, uh, on, 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 a particular, on, a, on a particular medicine. Um, now, Sidara is coming up very shortly for the approval of its new antifungal medicine to treat uh, candida. Now, candidiasis is a huge problem it's the first medicine, Candida albicans, it's the first new antifungal to treat Candida albicans in 30 years. Uh, that's another 99.9999999% chance of approval. Except Sidari, you're a little late on. Because it's gonna take Sidari, I think, to 250, 275. It's gonna get approved because Candida is a major problem in the hospital. Stick an IV in you, you can get candida. Um, in the ICU, you can get candida. You have immunological problems, you can get candida. It's everywhere. I mean, it's normal floor of the human body, unfortunately. I mean, if you swab your mouth, most people have candida. So it's, it's all around us. Symbol for this one? No, no, that's Sidara, Peter. That's a, medic that, that's a company that we're already in. Um, and I, I think the medicine's called Rezafungin, but don't quote me on that one. Um, uh, I mean, if I had time, I would go into the specifics. Um, 
Um, I, I would get you the exact name of the medicine. Um, but you, we're, you know, if you're coming in new, um, it's just a little bit too late. But Peter, I'm telling you, these opportunities are continually evolving. I mean, I mean, Sadara is a missed one. It's already close to 85% up. I wouldn't put, excuse me, put you in it now. But you're going to get new opportunities, and they keep coming. Have you ever had a position that was bought out by the large? I haven't. I sure as heck wish that would happen. That's another great question about a small biotech. You're in it, and then it's purchased. Uh, I have not, David. Those would need to be longer-term holds um, if you're looking for a buyout, because um, on, on their catalyst drug, that have to show that it brought a lot of money into the bottom line. And here's the other thing too, David, a lot of these companies have already partnered with companies. In other words, as much money as they've raised, and they usually have quite a bit of cash on hand in order for them to carry out uh, the full, uh, the, all of the uh, phases and then do the post marketing, um, the post approval marketing, they need to they need to partner. So off the top of my head, I can tell you that I believe one of the stocks, I'm not, I'm not going to hunt it down right now, is partnered with Janssen. So they already have partners with the with the bigger pharmaceutical firms. Now, may those bigger big pharmaceutical firms buy them out? Yes. But in two and a half years, I've not that had, not had the wonderful, that wonderful event happen to me. So we shall call you, okay, doctor, doctor. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that, Larry. So listen, I, I hope you'll come aboard. Um, I do an enormous amount of work. I take every trade I recommend, and you're always welcome to send me an email and ask for, and ask for my think or swim, and I will be more than happy to print you out a page and show you like five or six trades that I've entered and exited at the same price that you have. I take every single trade, and so do the professors at the University of Miami. We're all looking to make some money. And um, I hope to see you aboard, and I really, really thank you for your time. Everyone have a really, really wonderful evening. T take care, everybody, bye-bye.